Jesus had a right-hand man in Peter, and Hitler had a right-hand man in Speer, and, well, George Michael had a right-hand man in Andrew, was it Andrew? Andrew Ridgely? But Michael, Michael was my right-hand man, and without him, Waxing the Sun would have been, you know, a completely different kettle of fish. Part of our repertoire, repertoire comes from our days as buskers. Yeah, that's a big thing, but it hasn't been. We used to go busking every Friday, Saturday night. Oh, okay. But we're really young together. 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 And I'd, I had to take a tambourine or, no, no, no. or a suitcase with a snare, snare and, a hire. and a hire. Which is a big novelty because most buskers you just have one guy going on and on and on. And Michael would come along 
and within minutes the suitcase would be open, the snare would be up and it would just be, or from, from the distance all you could hear was just echoing right out across the city. Where would in, you? In literally Burke, Burke Street Mall, Sorry. right in the centre. And we did it every, and this is before drugs or alcohol, we just did it every, and this is true, every Friday night we go in there and play. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't always take in the drums. I'd sometimes just have a tambourine and a list of songs and my job would be to run That's right. up and down the street and sort of, not hassle, but sort of encourage people to, to choose a song. And my favourite line was, we can sing any song. We can play any song and then people would stop on this list. Ah, that was the sneaky. And, yeah, mm. and then so from and we that was probably ground us to dealing with hard audiences because there's no harder audience than the, the, the streets. It all began with Paul Italiano, just adding that sort of getting back cosmic to mm. ingredient, and he had that RX7. A before D, DX7, that's DX7. A car. he had a DX7 before they were even on the market. What's a D? Excuse me. It's a Roland keyboard, and um, we were sort of still pretty rocky and stuff. But he took it in a completely different direction. Well, he introduced strings, so we went from sounding like a backyard band to sounding something more like Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Mm. 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 Did he ask you to join his band? Did you get the impression that it was Adrian's band? Yeah, I always had the impression it was Adrian's band, uh -huh. and he had that that bath about him. Yeah. Um, and you know, he was he was the one organising everything. You know, when we would practice and presenting songs and so on, and so on. So. But so you you had a, a gig in the. Gig it was in the called, back a, part. called a gig in the grass. Gig in the grass. Yeah. It was sort of, it was meant to be, Woodstock, in North North Ball in Australia, but um. And then people it, got in for free. We were going to charge, but people got in for free. And there were other bands. No, it was or, just us. <laughs> what What are your memories of it? Because it, it just when I first interviewed the guys, and I hadn't, I hadn't seen the footage, and they were trying to explain it to me. I got an impression, you know, that it was an outdoor concert, maybe a local on a local level, but it was a kind of outdoor concert in a in a park in a public space, and not that it was actually the you setting up in the park and people walking around. Do you, do you remember, how did, did you all decide to do it? Um, or did Adrian No, decide? Adrian decided it was going to happen and then um, I suppose it was a, it was a, that was part of the working relationship. Then we, we did what we did to make it happen and I, I, you know, I'd get involved technically, you know, and for that part of being technical was we all pulled out um, resources to get extension cords <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to run power out from Adrian's house yeah. threw into the park. <laughs> uh, it was about probably four or five great big long extension cords and hoping we didn't, you know, suffer any uh, electrical shocks. got to be honest about the gig in the grass we were expecting thousands and um, there was more more select people came hundreds no it was ma mainly dozens there were a lot of women or older Twos women and threes. older women they're older women and uh, mm. and kids. they would have been just in the park no well, so a lot of them some of them did stay basically yeah. some of them like died. I said people passed through they They're, got us. They got. They got a, a vibe from the music. They felt the pulse, and then they, there was that one girl to keep running. 
There was yeah, that one girl who stayed for about an hour, didn't she? It was half an hour or something? Yeah, there, there were a few groupies. Your sisters came. Yeah, it was... Oh, yeah. It's mainly... Yeah, my sisters came. They, they've been big fans. Along with my mum. I think because I didn't have any talents per se in playing music, I mean I've got a bit of an ear for it but I really can't play, it just gravitated to wanting to be involved so I, I got involved in the technical side and essentially filling a hole more than anything else you know, with, with the lack of anything. I don't think they had an official dancer in the band and they didn't want no. one and I couldn't dance either so it, was, it just fell to me to be off stage doing the technical side of things and, and coupled with that came the sort of... I, Proxy managerial role. I wouldn't say I was managing the band in any way, but mm -hmm. but just sort of being involved in that thing as mates would do. And that gig in the grass, you were still at that stage. You were it was still the kind of fun, isn't this kind of? A, and then between no, we were pretty serious. we were pretty serious. If you look at the footage, yeah. it's pretty serious business. Yeah, I want to be able to play. I want to be able to play. I'm sure you'll find a way. I want to be able to play. I think you will. It's killing me. It's oh, killing me. Like, don't go to the toilet. Don't, don't worry. It's not that many people out there. Any idea how many? I've got that FAG! Hey, where's the music to that song? Which song? The Hendrix song. It's, not it's out there. there. It, it is. It's to do. No. Okay, let's go! Let's do it! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! We're going? Yes! Oh, you know, what was the story with you all leaving the band or parting the ways? It's, it's, it is shady. Um, my memory of it is, and I'm sure there's, there's more than one uh, version of events, but there was a, a gig at St. Bede's Primary School. And we, we put in a fair bit of work to be good. I'm guessing we were, you know, around 16-ish. I, I was a bit pissed because Adrian had sort of hit the Dutch courage a bit too hard before we went on stage, which had become a little bit of a theme when the opportunity presented itself, um, which he's since, I know, well and truly reformed on. <laughs> and, um, and then there was some issue with some of the people, like we, we'd hired equipment and with people getting paid. And I have a memory of um, Dave Fantasy. I can't remember who was there, but there was a bit of a kerfuffle and I was just like, you know, this, this and this has to happen or I'm, I'm gone. Uh -huh. And I was gone. <laughs> A particular gig there was a bit of a big disaster. Uh, we lost Paul on that night. I think I threw my sticks at him or something. Like that. He missed a bar on his keyboard. I can't remember. I don't think it was due to that. I think we were very tight in those days. It was so what, where does that kind of tension come from? Because at some point you 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 started off just kind of dancing around the Neil Diamond stuff. When when does it suddenly get that important that? Whatever happened, I mean, well, you, see, you seem a bit that's vague. That's a difficult coy, question. Uh, when does an individual become an egotistical rock and roller? Uh, yeah, did you did you like feel it happening? I could to feel it about the age of fourteen. What was the gap between Paul Italiano and your sound man? Sorry, 
Tom Reynolds and that. There are a few months of just despair. We just two of us have just played endlessly. And even my mum said would would comment and say, you know, you've got to get a third member because it, it just with the two of us it was too raw, guitar and drum. And Michael started singing at that time as well, but even that couldn't help. Maybe the band won't be, maybe there will be a different group of people because, as I said earlier, he was the, the sun around which the planets orbited. And it really, you could interchange the orb, you know, the band members were like light bulbs. When one was busted, you screwed in a new one. And I think ultimately, if he'd managed to hold it together or chosen wisely, but as I said, he chose poorly in new members, not because they were bad musicians, but because they were culturally going to, they were, yeah. it, it was, you know, it was bringing explosives to a bonfire. And it was just not going to, bad things were always going to come from it. And I mean, capital B, capital T, bad things. Money ain't everything the wise man knows. You either have the stuff or you don't. Got a side in front of their brain. Yeah, they're the ones that drive me insane. No more. I would prefer to be poor, yeah, than be a middle class man with this capital. My father said you've got to save away. Be careful how you spend your money in any way. But I just can't stand waiting. No, around that time, Waxing the Sun felt like a real band. Like, we, we all had the similar outlook. And, yeah, yeah, we, we were ready to take on the world. And I admit, you know, it was hard to cope with success because we were so young. And, yeah, no, one day we were playing at a school hall and the next day we were playing at a school theatre. Yeah, it was heady times. Tom Reynolds was our manager and sound man. And Nick Holloway was our kind of very own visionary and entrepreneur. And he wrote a play called Sergeant Peppers based on the Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles album. And he asked, he asked us or Waxing the Sun to dress up and perform as the Beatles. So, you know, we, we got to wear the Sergeant Peppers uniforms and, uh, you know, it was amazing to be the Beatles. Well, well, Nick, Nick was gay. We, we didn't know it at the time, but he he wouldn't he wasn't interested in any of the dancing girls who were in the play. So they sort of relieved all their pent up tension and their frustration out on us, which was you know it was well it was good. Yeah, but it was it was a tough gig because there's no doubt in the reality now. You know, it, this was a big time.
a bull run where after a certain amount of playing in the gig, say three hours down the track, Adrian would take a run up from the back it of the It happened once, the back this of the is hall. not true, it happened once. You would be playing for three hours. Yeah, and he just charged the drum kit. Is that, is that normal or was it just something about you guys? The crowd came and went. Yeah, it really did. We kept at, playing. At this particular, I think drink was a problem, but I think there was a guy called Fantasy and, and Michael was, he jumped up on a mic and I found my position being a bit suspect. Frustrated. So I went out of the hall and got a run up. Ran and down and crashed jumped all on, the instruments. Jumped on is, it, is this a kind of, you, you guys are not taking it seriously enough for me? We were taking it too seriously. Too seriously. Too seriously. Too seriously. My, my feeling was, and I think what this all comes from, and in fact every point now that I read it comes back to one really basic point, is the band were living like rock stars, but they weren't a rock band as such. They hadn't been signed, they didn't have a record, they played a few gigs to school kids, but they were behaving, they played in these little gigs and they were sort of living like, like a rock star dream, which is, I guess is the reason you get into rock and roll in the first place. So, yeah. And I, I think that's part of my indignation in this, is the fact that I'm saying, well, you haven't got any runs on the board. And what I'm not appreciating is that that's part of why they took it out in the first place. And do the rock star thing, they did. And, and I didn't understand it because I wasn't in the band. I didn't understand that that's you know, part of what it's all about in the first place. So, um, but I was also frustrated because I saw that no one, I mean, there's only a few bands ever that have been signed and been successful at 17 or 18. What I realized was they needed to go on a three or four year path that would lead them to big success. And it just seemed like they were, it was a marathon and they fell over just after the gun went. Mm. And I'm like, get up, run. But this is a document that Tom wrote as their manager. It says, Friday 10th of February 1989 should be remembered as a turning point for the band. It was the worst gig in the band's history. Yeah. Something must change or the band should go their separate ways. And then it says, it's got a kind of list of points. Playing in the band is a job and a profession and should be treated as such. This means turning up on time, working hard whilst on the job, completing every job, and not drinking on the job. Every member should display patience towards each other, no walking off, no physical violence. Then, this is the last time that band problems will be discussed or written about. Change must occur. This has arisen once already. Last chance. And I'm a good dog This sometimes throw me up Why is the keyboard so awful? Turn it down then, don't just sit there Got those swollen hands Got 13 channels of shit On the TV to choose from No one's listening I've got, I've got wild, wild staring eyes. When Bianchi arrived, um, when I met him, I just I felt the energy in, in him immediately, and I knew this was going to be a great thing. And he was keyboards, wasn't he? Keyboard yeah, players. keyboard player, and he turned up to our house one time just. Big headband. No, he was announced. Headband and five keyboards. Five keyboards. Five keyboards. Yeah. And what was your? How did you know the band? Um, I, had, I don't know. I, 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 mean, I brought up this embarrassing. Yeah, I'm sure it was our mothers who got us connected. It was my mum who we've talked about was mm -hmm. a big fan. Um, talked to your mum because and knew we needed a keyboard player. And we've been we've been auditioning lots of people and some bad results and then that's how it was and yeah. it was yeah and then Paul came around and it was just immediately click. was that just because he had so many keyboards no no same lifestyle no. same ah. lifestyle there was a a recording studio school I can't remember what it was called but they also went there and recorded some stuff and um, I think some of that um, uh, keyboard was either um, Chris Widows or um, Paul Bioni mm. and um, and I, I mean I, I still you know I still have that stuff and still listen to it from time to time yeah yeah I love it absolutely yeah. love it I mean you could say waxing the Sun peaked too early because um, it, it, it probably wasn't a good thing to make a masterpiece on your second album on your second release so 
I mean, I'd written some good songs on the first album, but on the second album, Spooning the Moon, every song was good. So, and I knew I'd made a perfect album, and the band knew they had made a perfect album. And, and one of my friends at the time, he said, you know, you've made a perfect album. So, it, it was hard. <laughs> I'm six feet tall, I'm pretty, the sun miles high. My sweet thing, she can't talk, she says she's too loud inside. Well, I don't blame her, you'd be tongue-tied too. If you only knew the things that I can do. I don't want a woman. The only, the only problem was that Spooning the Moon didn't sound like anything else, so uh, it, it, we knew it would take some time to sink in, and uh, it's only, you know, MTV was in full swing, so we thought, wow, we've got to get out there and make some top quality, world class clips, and you know, I think we did. Don't It Feel Good Now was a, it was a really sensual kind of sexual song and uh, yeah I think none of the band had girlfriends at the time so we had to get Michael to, right. we, had to we had to use what we had and I think Michael did a really good job, he did a sterling job. I know you've been thinking of me because your eyes, they give you away I can feel your touch all of my body And it makes me want to say Ooh, don't it feel good now? Ooh, yeah, let me put the sugar And your movements, they keep me frozen still You make me feel so much more than I am And your hands, they feel like messengers of Of, of delectation And the sun lights up my darkest fears Will you warn me? Will you give me your sweetest thoughts? Keep the softness of your eyes Free and true Okay. It's really hot in the dress. <laughs> 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 
Well, we we were dressing up in dresses then at, at one stage. Oh, Adrian actually made that part of the show at one stage. Mm. Um, and you, wardress, instance, you were wardressing. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I wore a ski suit. That's yeah, right, yeah, a ski yeah. suit. A big red mm. ski suit. And Adrian used to prance about on stage in a black dress, singing about, you know, he wants a little girl. And Not that there's anything wrong. With no, nothing wrong. That with was it. what it was, was happening back then mm. in those times. Mm. An interesting take on you know, a man in a dress wanting a little girl. It was. <laughs> You're making me out to be something. <laughs> this is, if, if you take it out of context, but at that time, I'm sure if you went across the gigs and the venues, uh, there would have been a lot of that. There would have been hundreds of men in dresses <laughs> talking about wanting a little girl. But Paul Bioni also worked out a bit back then, and he had no, he would have no shirt on, hair down to here, six pack. Six pack, yeah. And but so it's quite quite a lot to look at. drugs a problem? I mean, is, is oxygen a problem? I mean, the answer is yes, but if you look at Edmund Hillary, the guy who went to the top of Mount Everest, he had an oxygen problem, and was he surrounded by adoring fans? No. I mean, he had a couple of those cheapers or the, the chirper, chirpers with him, the, but they, they were little people, so he, he couldn't even see them. I mean, it was the same with Waxing the Sun. We were at the top of the music mountain and our fans were very hard to see. Well, I found them hard to see. And, um, you know, when you're living the high life, life can get pretty dangerous and nebulous. And to be in the pressure cooker of Waxing the Sun or to be in the steam room, you know, you, you, need, you did need to be on some kind of medication. Adrian stayed at... Um uh, like he was house sitting someone's house, and um, and I had a bit of equipment at that stage, and um, um, which which I lent to him, and and he recorded some stuff with that, and it was always Tom, usually Tom Reynolds, yeah. bringing me in, you know, oh, you got to see what Adrian's doing now, the stuff he's doing now is so good, and, yeah, you know, yeah, very Tom Reynolds enthusiasm, and and you know, I mean, he was right, um, some of the stuff he was doing was fantastic. I don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe it was the drugs or maybe it was a band. I just got frustrated at how long it took to organise a recording session or a rehearsal. And so I recorded the next album, Welcome to My World, on my own. Oh, it's all mine. 
friend's house, whose aunt was away, Adrian did some recordings, and it was just amongst, and it remains the most creative stuff I've ever watched someone do. I mean, he's using glasses of water as percussion and changing and drinking little bits of water to change the pitch of it. And that, as I said, that whole Beach Boys sort of creative process was like mesmerising, and it never went anywhere. Nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. After recording those songs on my own, I, I really felt ready for a, something, some big event with the band. And luckily, my dad was able to provide that event. And uh, he wanted us to play at his Christmas drinks at the hospital. And uh, that literally, I was playing in front of a whole lot of heart surgeons. So <laughs> it doesn't get any more professional than that. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the, this, this is probably after the time, it was our Alfred Hospital Christmas party. No, I've never. It was one of our biggest performances. A big performance, but with, I'd say, probably the least uh, crowd reaction we've ever had experienced. Mm. In terms of, it was top quality sound from our point of view, but from the mm. point of view of the audience, they were, you know, well, tra well trained heart surgeons and doctors who prefer perhaps a bit of Mozart or something. Jazz, yeah, they didn't understand. Uh, they didn't, they didn't, perhaps we were misunderstood. <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon and you can uh, I think we came out as loud as we could back then I mean with my hearing now that was probably one of the great deciding factors in my oh, hearing course, yeah, going your hearing's not no I what it was I had troubles that was probably one of the events the volume the sheer volume and that they were doctors they knew what was going to happen <laughs> Thank you. 
kind of experimental approach to drumming, which is very rare, where you stick to a 4-4 beat, but then I'd cross the beat for some reason, where you start sort of playing the beat backwards. And that would drive the rest of the band mad. I mean, Adrian would turn around and hiss and hum. No, I, it's, there's a lot of tapes of me just whack, whack, just to bring it back, not knowing that Michael had gone changed the he whole He wasn't thing. actually whacking me, he was just whacking us. No, it wasn't. No, it, wasn't. <laughs> it was just like, come on, back on the beat. And then- We would probably say whack, And there was whack. a bit of a Italiano tension with Michael as well. Yeah. I suppose one of the amusing things was that the, the drummer we had in that band was excellent. And it wasn't until I, I drummed with this guy that I had a bit of an appreciation for Adrian's frustration for Mike over the years. All right, okay. I was always a bit annoyed with Michael sometimes with, you know, you can drink a few beers before a gig. <laughs> Michael got up and he'd been drinking jugs all night. It just, the time would go... It was terrible. Way off and, up, and, and it down. would just be a mess. Yeah. And I've even got tapes. Well, there goes the rhythm section. You've got yeah, the bass player on one sounds... thing, the drummer's pissed. Mm. Hello. I mean, I, I always really liked the music. But um, I must admit, like now that we're adults and we're a lot older, yeah, I must admit um, there were times when I didn't like Adrian very much. <laughs> I've got to tell you that right now. There were times like fuck, mate. I tell you, there were some times I just wanted to go. Maybe I should leave the room. Whack. Yeah. And none of the other guys had a car, so who was the sucker who had to drive all the bloody gear home after the gig? You know, uh, and and all the rest of it. While the guys stayed at the pub and got pissed, you know. But that was the main thing, which we don't have any footage of, is the Richmond Club, where we played lots of gigs. Was it like a residency, or were you just? It was every there Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a residency. And you were starting to get a feeling and the, the following there, and yeah, it'd be yeah. And we had a room upstairs that, and but the guy who ran the place, you could probably just Steve called Steve. I'm sure he's. I don't know if he's still running anything now, but he was a bit Possibly dodgy. Possibly some syndicate behind bars. Again, he didn't have a thing where you had to pay at the front if you want to see the music. No, we get a lot of charge. we get a lot of the front bar just drifting in, you know? Mm. He was only paying us 50 bucks. Mm. You can't but that was good in a way. I think I think that was good. <laughs> so, in the, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe for you. <laughs> just extra not people. Me. Not for <laughs> me. Maybe not. 50 bucks for the band. No, not the money. I'm talking about the front bar people. Drifting, but yeah. then, but then, but then we had that little disaster. Remember down at the Evelyn, that guy booked us for all those gigs and never paid us. After all the turmoil of what is now known as the troubles of Wax in the Sun, or just the troubles, I went, I went back to my parents' house because I just to lick my wounds. I'd had enough, and just then I I, I heard my sister playing the drums, and. Uh, it was, it was amazing timing because Wendy had started to play the drums and she was really good and I bumped into an old school friend who played the bass so I was suddenly, yeah, Waxing the Sun was reborn and um, it was, it, I started writing new songs and this is well before the White Stripes so, you know, and we actually were a brother and sister so, you know, we, we preempted the White Stripes but you don't, you know, you don't hear about that.
weren't just a three piece that were you? There was another. There was a Justin Blackwing. Black yeah. Place. He's yeah. yeah he's. Uh, no, on guitar he played rhythm. Guitar. Yeah, he played rhythm, and okay. he and Wendy were going out together. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah, we're all adults here. I guess. <laughs> 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 That's not good. <laughs> 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 there wasn't much tension there that I can remember compared to the other lineup. Uh-huh. There would, would be a lot more. And yet, the, the the actual songs are quite a lot darker than they were. To start. Yeah, they were. Yeah. <laughs> Before I did a gig, I'd, and I'd try and keep everyone in check and say, Don't. Smile. You were well, Justin, I didn't smoke. Yeah, at you all. didn't much at all. And I didn't really drink when I played drums. That's right, so. You'd have your slates for all something. I used like to have a thing of. Yeah, yeah. A mixture of gin. vodka and gin. And by the end. And I'd have. <laughs> by the end. It'd be harder to follow, but. <laughs> yeah, well, see, yeah, because Wendy. And the guitar I'd always got louder, too. Yeah. <laughs> quantity of. Uh, <laughs> Clean spirits game. That's true. It was about 1994 that I thought, waxing the sun, you know, we're getting too big for Australia. So I thought it's time to go to London to show to show London or England or the rest of the world that there's more to Australian music than Midnight Oil and In Excess, you know. Yeah, and the Beatles moved from Liverpool to London and I I moved from Melbourne to London. So it was there was a longer trip and I landed in London in the summer of Britpop or yeah Brit, Britpop was like a kind of British national musical uprising for British bands sort of a reaction to the American grunge scene and um, it was Oasis, Blur, Pulp, Radiohead and Bubblegum Education Bub- bubblegum Education, yeah, yeah, that, w- that would be, you haven't heard of them. Well, no, I actually joined Bubblegum Education as a lead guitarist. <laughs> I mean, and I was able to steal the bass player and the drummer from that band to, uh, yeah, to be in my band. So I got them and then Wax in the Sun was reborn in the UK. There are people around you expect great things. It's hard to be an invincible girl. They keep pushing you forward, you keep trying to please. Hard to be. Oh, 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 oh,
great things. It's hard. And, and that was the push, mm-hmm. which was the name of the band as well, wasn't it? It was Wax in the Sun. Yeah, the, the name of the album was the Push. Oh, okay. Sort okay. of merging the two. Sometimes we were the Push, and sometimes we were Wax in the Sun. I mean, yeah, th- this was a big time because we had, I think, we had two songs on that CD compilation in London, and we'd already had one. We'd already had one song on a, a, a record compilation in Australia. So, you know, what, what was next? What was next? Oh well, we, we did a professional photo shoot in London, London Fields. The guy, our bass player, had a camera with a timer on it so he could press the timer and then be in the photo at the same time. So, and he had a really snazzy camera. It was kind of magical. And um, I, there must have been some magic that afternoon because, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen better photos than those. Because that's actually how I lost my voice, oh, was due to this man. Yeah. He took me to a karaoke <laughs> night with his brothers and I would been up jet lagged, smoking and drinking and I overdid the karaoke and got a yeah. module on my throat. Mm. So that, that really put an end to the England excursion because I couldn't go back after that. Sorry, oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it was a good karaoke night. So it was one night, karaoke night. One night, yeah. <laughs> and then, you remember, no, the, next you remember day the song that did it? Drive My Car. Maybe you can drive my car. I think it was. <laughs> I think it was. I was doing the high McCartney. And so how long did it take before your throat got de not two eyes? It was nearly a whole year. Okay. Of not singing. And that's when I... We got, oh, we did play because we had Andrew Quadros. Yeah, we got a friend in and Justin Buckley yeah. switched to bass, I think. Yeah. Because you were playing, you had another band. Then. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Wendy right. and I kept together and that's that song Bitterness, the long one, I think you heard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, that kept going, and then I lost my hearing. So oh, that's right. Some of the last few gigs you had earplugs. Yeah, in I had earplugs in, and, and I, I got my throat back after a year, and then my hearing went. So. But you soldiered on. No, no, I didn't. After that, that Stop. was the end of waxing the sun. That was that was it. Open your mouth and 
shake your head But you can't change me I'm the one who knows what he's doing It's all gone to my head again I do my best, I do my best, I do West strikes me and seems perfectly, perfect, not perfectly happy, but kind of blissfully unbitter about this and whole, the whole kind of thing, the whole a, lack of anything. And I think that's what I'm getting back to, is that, that the path that has, has been taken is one that no changes along the way could have changed, could have made any difference. And I think that's why, you know, I think that's why ultimately Adrian's happy with where he is, obviously. But... I don't know, I'd always have the question about the what if, but like, you can't live like that. I think mm. if you live your life as, what, as a series of what ifs. And, and, and music, it's a fickle bastard of a business. And I, I worked in music in that um, roadie role for many years. And I worked with very successful bands. I toured with the likes of ACDC. I did the early big days out. I saw Nirvana twice. Um, I did, I organized, as late as 2000, I ran a, a stage for the Offshore Festival. Um, I worked in community radio, I did all that. and. And there's so many bands that plug away and never make any success. And, and, and it, often it's not their fault. Mm. Um, a chance occurrence, a little thing along the way. I do think it's easier, to, to, the pathways to success today are easier. But as I said, the creative process, the things required have not changed. Mm. That's remained the same. I don't think bands have it easier at all. But um, yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a cruel, vicious bastard of an industry. And it's run by bastards who don't care much for who you are, they're just more interested in the finances and, and you know, that's, that's the way life works and I think Wax and Sun it may have evolved, and I'm talking so hypothetical, I think they may have been able to evolve into a, a successful commercial outfit, but they were carrying it, they were dragging behind them 300 tonnes of explosive all the way mm. and, you know, Bless them, they're all still alive because I think if they'd been successful, we would have lost the one or two. No one can hurt you this way. I thought you'd never fall. You never made it the way you wanted to. Don't look too good when you crawl. You have just about a shoulder. It always made you something called the post waxing the sun period in our association with fans and band members um, it's something you go through for some life. people it could be painting or tennis even but it's usually something other than the sound of waxing the sun it stimulates people back to spiritual growth again mm. and then what the and because waxing the sun being so unique, afterwards you can't carry on in that music. We can't carry in on area. In, in life. There was, and then after that, and I mean now, are you, are you in bands now? Oh, no, more so just jamming with friends, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, doing fundraisers. I play for, um, play once a month for a magic, a magic show. Oh, okay. Um, so just supporting... The magicians, some of them have stuff all prepared, some of them ad lib and happy for you to interject musically. Uh-huh. And so what are you doing now, Paul? Are you playing now, Paul? Uh, at the moment, no. I've, um, I am looking forward to to resuming that at some stage. Um, uh, I don't have my piano with me at the moment, um, okay. but I'm looking at the moment to try and create some room so I can actually squeeze And do you still in. have all the Leslie and stuff? Yes, like I've still got the Leslie to, um, valve portableized touring Ready to go. Well, if 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 the if the moment takes me, if I have an elderly moment, one time I might pack it up. 
But the only thing is that I don't really have a vehicle to transport it around in. I mean, I've got a sedan now. Back in those days, I had a. I used to have a Ute. Um, mm. oh, back then, I had the Volvo. Um, and so I could fit everything like that in there, um, but not now. Yeah, well, yeah, most of the band did get back together to make the film. You know, for the most part, we are damaged people, and I don't think anyone in Waxing the Sun, you know, came out of this, the whole experience unscathed. I think that, you know, whether it's mental or physical or spiritual, we all lot came out, you know, with some damage, but that's to be expected. I think that nothing was done with any half measures, and, uh, that's that's what rock and roll is all about. That's it's all about the eternal Saturday night or to, to rock around the clock, and it, it's not about taking stock. And I think the bands that do carry on, you know, they must be doing something wrong. Uh, it's like seeing your uncle getting drunk and dancing in the kitchen on Christmas Eve. You, it's it, it it looks wrong and it feels wrong. And I think that Wax in the Sun did. You know, we had no career trajectory or curve or arc but we definitely did experience something and achieve something and I think it's still there in the music and and that that's really all all that matters.